that's why I'm here today. But usually I come here just to, for networking and I like technology. Right. Uh, hi, my name is Edgar. I'm also working at Microtech. And uh, so I'm here because of that. Okay. And uh, there is some micro products in uh, my programming. Hmm, cool. So yeah, um, this is actually a big, big picture. Picture why this this stuff is interesting for me because this is one of the parts of the exponential, so-called exponential technologies. Um, because parallel programming using computer vision and machine learning, and there's really cool stuff uh, based on NVIDIA marketing stuff. Media uh, marketing, NVIDIA marketing, some kind of uh, picture they, they draw, draw for me. So, but uh, there's a different lot of things are interesting. So, drones, automotive 3D printing, artificial intelligence, biotechnology, design, robotics, and that's uh, there's a lot of uh, meetups are to, to foster those changes. Uh, in uh, exponential technology ecosystem boosting and lately. So the cup, uh, this is a couple of slides from previous meetup. We talked uh, we talk about uh, CES and uh, yeah, probably since you are a lot of uh, in your face since since last last uh, good meetups, there's a couple of pictures. Maybe you skip skip uh, skip them somewhere somehow. So this is an Nvidia um, self-driving car that processed in the CES based on the parallel programming computer vision. Uh, it's a car made by Audi. This is actually is also some pictures from um, uh, from, from CES uh, when uh, where Jets of TKI, which is actually an embedded platform from NVIDIA, NVIDIA uh, using uh, cool technology, is used for uh, real real uh, real uh, mod real time picture remodeling on screen because it's actually filming this house and uh, in 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 in, in uh, in the computer, you could see a real-life uh, model, which is actually developing. This is a demo. It was uh, some kind of demo, somehow demonstrated in CES. And this actually is one uh, international pa interesting part from, from CES. It's called Renault. It's one of the Silicon Valley startups. It's uh, uh, yeah, Silicon Valley is, is becoming more and more automotive, and uh, this is a project uh, fully, uh, fully, fully electric car, costing. Half a billion dollars, something like that. <laughs> and uh, this picture is taken from CES, and because uh, they're using NVIDIA GPU power in the uh, information screens uh, inside. And there's a couple of slides from from uh, key point, uh, uh, keynote presentation of uh, NVIDIA uh, CEO. This is actually a picture of. Uh, a lot from from last year, I brought Tegra K1, which is actually previous uh, previous um, some sort of uh, generation of uh, microchips uh, using CUDA uh, in a very effective effective way. Uh, way. Um, previous generation had 192 cores, and this year they introduced an automotive grade Tegra X1 uh, mobile super chip, and this super chip have 256 uh, Maxwell GPU, Maxwell technology uh, developed by CUDA, uh, which is actually very effective uh, in terms of uh, consuming power. And um, this is, is used in two ways uh, in the automotive industry. They built a uh, last year, it's actually very, very quite new product, despite that uh, NVIDIA, um, so, so, Super chips used are used already in Tesla. Uh, Tesla Model S uh, Linux-based automotive trade system. But uh, this is actually they built last year very new. Uh, there are two types of embedded systems: so computer, microcomputers. One is Drive CX, which is big digital cockpit computer, and the second is Drive PX, which is an autopilot computer they call them. And uh, this is how it looks like uh, this CX, which is uh, is a dig uh, digital imaginary some kind of platform from CUDA. Using uh, this new um, super chip, and this is a result from 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 cockpit. This is how they, how they see the world today, it's like flat, and this is how they try to build a you know three-dimensional uh, experience for drivers. This is a comparison for for um, what we have now. It is well, I think uh, this plastic panel is taken from from Tesla type type of some some sort of. Uh, Image and this is actually is uh, is uh, rendered by the new this GPU platform, and it's possible to make very very dynamic picture of that.
and this is a Drive BX um, 12 camera inputs, uh, dual Tegra X1 uh, computers, and at last the last time they showed a uh, uh, very simple architecture for that, for this stuff. Um, in last the last model uh, for testing they used 12 cameras uh, for live 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 imaginary around the car. This is a, this is some sort of picture. Uh, I'm I'm gonna be the uh, Next development, uh, developer conference in San Jose, and uh, learn more about what, what, how, how practically they, they, they do it, how, how far they uh, um, are they in development, are, are this only test, uh, test some kind of equipment or just you know, really production. But uh, this supercomputer is actually is able to, to, to real, uh, in real time uh, regenerate those, those images from all whole 12 cameras simultaneously. And uh, how, how I need it, but positioning is itself by, in terms of technology, uh, they uh, created this buzzword called the Deep Neural Network. It's actually it's quite old term, but uh, could, uh, uh, sorry, NVIDIA really reinvented uh, in terms of marketing this, 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 this kind of uh, deep learning and other stuff um, process. How, how, how they, how they, uh, learn, how, how they teach computers uh, to understand live picture. And this is actually this picture of how it works uh, this deep neural network learning course of like that from different images and how how these computers understand how the, what what is actually is in this picture. And this is uh, this is uh, some sort of test I don't know test test some kind of uh, pictures or uh, project screens where um, a uh, camera from car could, could understand uh, what 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 this, what kind of, of object is that? Is it passive uh, pedestrian or uh, or, or, or uh, some blind pedestrian or some some threats on, on it or on the wood where, where it's caused for the car and uh, understand uh, recognized vehicles, uh, school buses, like uh, ambulances. And this is actually a live picture from uh, testing. Uh, this computer around and with the headquarters in Sunnyvale, so you can see the entrance uh, to the media headquarters science. And uh, this computer is uh, after one week of testing, they they they, they teach this computer to understand uh, police cars and vans and something like that in one week. And uh, this how machine learning is um, is working in this picture quite uh, quite impressed me at, at this moment because uh, it means what the, this, this part is uh, NVIDIA Drive PX, which is actually is in, inside the car. And this NVIDIA GPU supercomputer is, is, is GPU cloud and uh, data scientist who is, um, who is, who is uh, uh, working on those uh, million pictures on the standard, uh, those objects and recognize uh, which is actually that. And uh, the, the, um, all excitement in this picture is that uh, if this NVIDIA Drive PX system uh, sees, sees some, some, something uh, unusual and uh, can't recognize, uh, the system sends uh, this image up to the cloud. Uh, cloud is analyzing this picture and uh, recognizing objects and then down, uh, download uh, those, those uh, recognized objects to the whole uh, fleet of uh, cars. Something like that, and it's actually is quite, 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 quite interesting for future. Um, so this is some some kind of uh, recognition scores of Alex Net, which is uh, how how image per second uh, this graphical card is understood. Uh, this is uh, how looks round vision. So for the for those who don't know that uh, this picture in the, in a, in a, in a, in, a, in a middle is, is made. Uh, from the four uh, different angles, side cameras, and it's actually actually compiled, compiled, and then and, and, and it's you, you see yourself inside, you know, like like from above, but uh, there's no no camera above. And this is a picture from the uh, drive PX round vision, how it's recognizing objects and uh, in parking lots of like that. Yeah, so a couple of uh, it's, it was covered by, covered by the CES uh, about featured events. Um, uh, this is actually this is, this is, uh, next uh, NVIDIA GPU conference in March 17 in Silicon Valley, in San Jose. 
So we together with Rudolf we're going to be there because uh, I was uh, I was there last uh, last last year, and we decided this year to send proposal for scientific posters. This is actually a little bit uh, scratched. Yeah, <laughs> a little bit uh, changed uh, the picture, but the, the the name for the project was NBN's NBank based. And coding for with some uh, machine-based monitor wall architecture. So we uh, uh, participated in those uh, scientific poster contest, and we got an invitation to to, to come present there. So we need to be there, and uh, let's see how it goes in terms of networking and uh, turning this idea to start. <laughs> yeah, and uh, this is the probably last announcement from my side. Uh, this is a whole whole other uh, network uh, events which I'm trying to. to Show up, you know, if, if you're interested in that. So tomorrow will be 3D, 3D printing uh, meetup in uh, February in the uh, uh, Riga Technical University Design Factory. And then next is February 11th for Riga Biotechnology meetup. So everything's related to the wet and uh, not wet science uh, or IT related things that uh, are, are, are welcome there. So this is the final year co founder, most uh, entrepreneurship oriented. Uh, Event for every early stage of pitching, not for investors, but for uh, to find your co-founders. And UI UX rig meetup uh, held here in February 23, and we get featured speaker from England called Mouse, I am, uh, talking about design things and UI mix. Uh, then we have rig draw meetup in uh, February 24, and then we have rig mobile application developer meetup in 20, February 25. And last but not least is uh, Rig Bitcoin, Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies meetup. I suppose that we will have somebody from Estonia uh, Cryptocurrency Association to as a featured speaker for that time. Yeah, so this is actually a featured project part, so I will give floor to the Christops and uh, he will talk about this nice initiative from uh, LGA called Labs of Life. meetups and, and stuff like that, but uh, there will be one place uh, to look for this kind of information and we will try to get together the all um, uh, information about the relevant events in one calendar. So, for example, now if you want to, to 
to, to go to uh, startup events, you would have to look at uh, various calendars and spend a lot of time looking for them. And uh, for media, uh, so there will be one, again, platform, one place for, for example, TechCrunch and uh, some big media to ask for information regarding uh, Latvian startups or maybe via us or to get the contacts uh, right from those startups. And yes, there will be a um, community generated content. So the startups will be able to publish their own news, uh, some, some information, and uh, there will be editorial content uh, from me and from my colleague Maria, who is writing for Arctic Startups uh, now. Yes, and there are some mock-ups of uh, design, this news page, and then, and then, then for example, uh, that the way will the new news page will look like. And then, and then the, this one is a uh, yeah, startup database, uh, information about startups, and then, then, then this more information about startups and all those links and then news and there will be again uh, one like a uh, place where investors can create only from Latvia or from Baltic or from Europe or from whole world uh, good question it's a good question yeah. <laughs> uh, yes yes basically let's see how it goes but the main idea if they're interested in uh, like in, in, in our market and, and, and Latvian startups, then they should uh, create a profile and so to, to reach our guys. But uh, let's see how it goes. Mm -hmm. Yes, we have we have some database of uh, investors, but they'll be able to create their own profiles. So, and yes, more of course, the the investor way. profile. Yes, yes, and of course you can uh, later log in uh, in this platform and claim uh, your profile. Uh, for now, we gathered information from AngelList and TechCrunch, and we like uh, updated information so that it will be like uh, right information. But uh, start owners will be able to claim their profiles and to add their information, their news, and and we really hope uh, that startups will uh, use uh, this possibility, like to create one uh, tool to speak to investors and media in one place. Yes, and, uh, that's how uh, some news and um, yeah that's the team so Maria is like editor and uh, covering startup news and yes she's she, she's written for Arc Startups if you know this uh, blog covering startups from <laughs> Nordics Baltics and I myself will be covering more technology news. So I, I suppose Maria is not really interested in CUDA and parallel programming. I myself maybe don't know much about it, but uh, I'm interested in this stuff. So if you if you see that uh, uh, there is some great news uh, to talk about, to write about, and so others can see, just talk to me, and then and I'll, I'll try to uh, write as correctly as possible. So, and uh, the third contact is Yekaterina Zaitseva, she's a uh, lady from uh, the Latvian Guarantee Agency, so some kind of boss for us. Uh, yes. And then, then that's, of course, you can write down our information, and information and contact will be on the website of Latvia.com. And then, 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 yes, and there are some, some questions. Yes, why? why labs? Yeah, if you have Angel is crunch based tech hub. Uh, we want to see labs of Latvia as, as one place that's made exactly for Latvian startups, for, for, for local information, for local content. But it will be in English. Yeah, it will be in English because of uh, investors, basically, and sure. some other startups. Of course, we can write in Latvian, but uh, then there will be a few thousand like, readers. So, and not, re no, not, not much reach for, for you guys. So, local, but uh, understandable from outside. And then we are not trying to compete with AngelList and Crunchbase. We just want to, to create one like, space for 
my screen started. But it's possible for you to uh, make a contact inside Crunchbase in order to submit some articles from you to the Crunchbase. Uh, because it's it's quite quite diff uh, difficult for Latvian startups to be to be to be exposed in Crunchbase in general. Even in Arctic startups, sometimes very hard. <laughs> so, is, is there some kind of um, trust gateway for Crunchbase kind of platform um, in the editorial some kind of uh, relations? I think that uh, we will try to create those possibilities. <laughs> so yes. When there will be a lot of startups using clubs of Latvia, then of course uh, those big media will know where to look and then they mm -hmm. will like, okay, believe what's written. So, who's editing labs content? Uh, okay, team. So, basically, we, Maria, me, and Tov, and Yekaterina, and, 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 yes, and. <laughs> We are but neutral, we are not like interested in, in promoting one startup and not promoting other startup. And our editorial editorial content will be not biased, so it will be like neutral. But uh, you as a startup will be able to publish content. Of course we will review it, so it will not be like bullshit content. But uh, in your community generated content you can be biased. So you're proactive or active, so you're, you're, you're passive, uh, you're waiting for startups to be send the PR news and uh, some descriptions of themselves to you, or you're going to find startups and write them about them. Both, both. And we are proactive, like we are, <laughs> that's why I'm here and I'm talking about this platform. Then we will be like uh, gathering this information and then we'll be talking to startups so that they can use this mm -hmm. platform and uh, publish their information. So it's both ways, you can't do it like one way only. Editorial content, yes, our side. Analytical content, community content is really important. It's your stories. Future for the platform. Yes, and we will be on March 3rd. So March of the We have a bit of time. Uh -huh. It's building right now. And then, 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 ah, there will be. Uh, if you have ideas of uh, how to improve this idea, uh, how to create this uh, platform better, uh, don't hesitate to, to send us your ideas because at the launch event uh, we will like organize some, some rewards about it. If it will be good enough and great. So. Yes, it's five minutes. Yeah, I got a question. So, uh, is this platform related to technology startups or startups in general? And how you distinguish those technology for not this not not, not be technology? Because we are have, we get a lot of lifestyle and small, medium uh, uh, sized enterprise here, which actually claim that, that technology related, but in reality not. Our idea is to uh, like work more with technology and the science science technology startups with uh, fashion startups and maybe not okay let's see where it goes but uh, mainly we are like uh, focusing on technology startups so um, to understand the overall concept of the labs of Latvia it will be a blog Will be more than a blog. It will be so, like event category or about the events, startup events. Uh, uh, maybe if events if like Infogram is creating some event, mm -hmm. uh, there will be like information profiles of startups. So yeah, so there will be some kind of all the startups send in their information stories and you publish it, and then uh, with uh, as well as their content. So investors go to your site, they read about all the startups. And if they're interested, they're trying to reach them, as well as there's going to be event calendar and everyone can attend those events. Or it's the events are for uh, the startups only? No, events are for, no, for, for everybody who's interested yeah. in them. But, uh, but the 
those profiles will be about startups, right? There will be startup pro uh, pro so profiles for startups, profiles for investors, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, profiles for the guys who are like doing startups. Mm -hmm. That is very important for guys like um, Rudolf, for example, that is uh, researching something in universities and would like to do, turn this idea or some, some, some research into the startup itself. And it's crucial for them sometimes to, to find uh, team members or team yes. co-founders or something like that. And we lack such a platform for, for, for them to write about the idea and what they're looking for and something like that. Are you going to build something inside, inside this one? <laughs> it's it's a tough question uh, for now, but uh, yes, the idea is that Rudolf will be, will be uh, like he will be the place where he can get information about other guys who are doing the same stuff. Then he'll say, okay, those guys are like, for example, attending this event, and uh, they'll come together and found a startup and get uh, a few millions of dollars yeah. and, and, and be rich and famous. And, <laughs> Yeah, because uh, we, we sometimes need this connection between technical guys with ID and business development guys, which actually to be, uh, to, to be uh, uh, convinced that this, this idea is very valuable, let's say, and fell in love with the idea because, yeah. And usually technical people are not very uh, communicating with each other, so they're very passive sometimes. So it's, <laughs> be good that they could write some kind of uh, short en entry, entry for about himself and uh, ID or something like that. And we'll talk with that. Yes. Yes. <laughs> it's a bit different. This is more, this is more public. I think it's more outward facing. But mm. it might be, it might be some. Yeah, maybe not. Of course, not. there is one idea that we want uh, the platform to be, and then there this other side about you guys. Yeah, yeah. You, you have your own ideas. Yeah, yes, uh, yeah. You have like your uh, maybe mm -hmm. afraid of some like stuff. But so the info at lapsoflatvia.com. You can write us, and then uh, we'll really try to make the platform uh, easy and informative for you to use. Oh, any more questions? Or? Okay. Who, who, who made the little logo on the right hand corner? The, 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 the this one? one? Yeah. Some, some designer. Uh, is, it, is, it, is it for you or is it for you? Uh, the design is made with our ID. Our ID like is like technical. Is that the design is made with our project, so the designer, one lady who's coming to the UI, you can meet here. So <laughs> you don't like to meet them. Yeah. You like that design, yeah. Oh, right. Okay. I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll try to find, track down the designer <laughs> and I'll say. But uh, how, how the UI UX interface is very good. Seems to be very good, actually. It's uh, surprising me. It's surprising me because it's actually a government-based platform, and we know how government-based platforms look like usually. <laughs> well, it's, it's not government-based. It's uh, government-initiated. Yeah, but uh, it's created by usually, IT guys. Yeah, yeah, sure. But usually, uh, government like to see uh, system-oriented platforms, and they decision because they they pay for that, and they make make decision how the how the, those platforms look like. <laughs> If you see, the forest, for example, a lot of the investment agency platform uh, homepage, so you, you get to <laughs> know what's going on. So it's uh, very surprising for me that it seems to be very nice. Any more questions for me? Okay, so yeah. Uh, so we could, go, we could switch to the room. To play the F. Let's use it. So hi, my name is Rudolf Sobiu. In the I think it was two or three months ago when I presented the state of my research at that point, but for the new phases, I'll try to tell what it's all is about, since Christoph is a technology fan and he could be at, well, maybe at some point fond of this. So, um, I'm a PhD student at the University of Latvia, and we're building um, 
a high resolution based video wall. Basically, I started that because I couldn't find an e easier theme for my PhD thesis, but actually turned out pretty interesting. Um, my initial scope was to actually use this for either gaming or for CCTV surveillance, because those are kind of two um, areas where a large screen done by a projector is not good enough, because you actually need a big number of pixels. I mean, you don't want just to upscale a video and have it blurred and uh, a lot of artifacts. And, I mean, for games, it would allow you to play, let's say, RPG or strategy games, seeing all the map at once, or for CCTV, it's very crucial to see a lot of cameras on, on the screen at the same time, so a uh, guard can like see 20 cameras in the object, and if the cameras are full HD, actually only gets the full HD feed, not what, I mean, since I'm working in the CCTV uh, sphere myself, I see that uh, there are people buying now even 4K cameras and then showing them on one 4K screen, the cameras are being downsampled, and basically you just don't get what you want. So we're trying to solve this, and Rehards has been very helpful by giving us a uh, Tesla and a uh, One Maxwell card, which we're using now um, to uh, um, do the encoding. But so to get some notion of this, um, I'll try to s kind of explain more. Um, I think some of you have seen that basically so far. There have been good examples with virtual monitors because there's a lot of devices and softwares that either stream software to iPad and other tablets, which then act as a secondary monitor, which is all kind of cool, but that's all done at driver level. And as I found out last month, somebody in the US has even taken out a patent on this, so that's a no-go anymore. They basically have patented a driver that hooks in, I mean, it's patented only under Windows, but what happens is that they hook a false driver under the real driver for the graphics card, that false driver reports additional screen and then the false driver gets all the data from video memory and basically pushes it over to either tablet, TV, whatever you need. But I mean that's basically for good for presentation where, where you have like a PC that's standing in the corner and you want to do something either with a tablet or just present somebody with a TV. But in terms of having a large and uh, high-resolution surface, which is kind of hard dependent and always dependent, there's currently no good work. And what we found out, that actually virtualization, and namely we are using VirtualBox, can, can really solve this issue. Because it, um, I recently saw a really good paper in the US. Uh, they made a huge wall uh, for analysis of astronomic data. What they did, they took a very high-end server with four GPU slots. They put an AMD Fire Pro card, which each have a um, six video outputs. Each of them is 4K, so they got what was the number? I mean, you can count it yourself. It's like six outputs per card, four cards per cluster, and then they had like 18 of those nodes. And they, I don't remember the total amount. It was something million pixels. But the budget for that was also, I think, around a million dollars. So it's, well, I actually looked up the com company that made those nodes, and yeah, well, I mean, they don't even publish the prices on the servers, everything, but because, I mean, at least from Amazon, the AMD uh, Fire Pro card, each one costs around four thousand dollars. So, well, I mean, it's like under around thousand for that, for one up. So that's kind of very expensive if you, if you just want to have like a high resolution screen for, and for home to watch movies or do something like that. Of course for science, I mean, it's, the money is not that a big, big object. But, so what we found out is that using virtualization, we can actually make the OS that produces the content we want. The thing it has a virtual GPU, which you can fi configure as you want. I mean, have as many outputs as you want, have resolutions as you want. And actually, if we are capable of then collecting the data from the virtual GPU, and it could and stream it over to an actual physical display wall, we can create a system which is very modular because we can actually put the encoding hardware as capable as we need. I mean, if you need a 25 FPS um, stream, then you would actually choose, yeah, higher end cards. If you uh, are streaming basically Windows apps, you can get it out with one GPU. I mean, uh, the thing I'll show you was actually previously before we got the cards from Bihert, was driven by a single Intel Iris Pro GPU, which is kind of good. It had like 16 uh, full HD monitors driven by one GPU. 
And uh, basically, uh, of course, it wasn't able to, to like show the movie on the full screen, but for using Windows apps like Chrome and that stuff, basically you didn't have any lag. So that's kind of impressive. And um, to yeah, try to present. So this is one of the pictures we got improved. It's one from the latest locations. It's still very detailed, but I'll try to still walk you through. So you have a virtual machine. Um, in this case, you can forget about virtual. Just, you can imagine that that's a virtual box. So we have virtual box, which is running um, against OS, which is chosen by us. And then we configure the virtual machine's virtual GPU and tell it how many monitors and resolutions we want. Basically, we match that with the monitor wall we have. So at the University of Latvia, we have a monitor wall, which is 5x5, 22 inch LCD displays. And we used to do that so that we told the virtual machine it has 25 out uh, displays. Now we've actually gotten to a mode where we can tell the virtual machine it has one really big display and Windows is actually capable of handling that, which is kind of cool. Because I mean, you don't have any GPUs with that res resolution in the shelf. So you, I mean, it was just like, I wanted to see if Windows can handle that, it can. And then we're splitting, uh, we're coding the virtual GPU data from the virtual box and then doing hardware-based H.264 encoding and streaming everything over to the display wall. And display wall is basically consisting of um, displays which where each one is backed by a decoding node. Currently we're using Raspberry Pi because it's very cheap and it's, it is capable of decoding uh, full HD stream flawlessly. Um, if there are some new cheap 4K decoding units. We could switch to that because NVIDIA, as far as I see, they currently support 4K video encoding and that would, in the same time, reduce the number of monitors on the side of the wall and again increase uh, the area of the green cover. Uh, while, I mean, from the tests I've done on the wall, even this, uh, 5x5 is actually kind of hard to interact because the details are very small and if you run Windows on the native scale, if you stand like more than three meters away from the wall, it's actually hard to see the detail. But um, our issue is that the wall was made of 22 inch monitors. I mean, if, it, if those were like 14 inch TVs, I think it would be actually better. But I mean, yeah, nobody knew how it's going to turn out. Um, so basically, there's no single high cost um, element in this heap. You basically have a cheap embedded device in the code. The monitors, I mean, again, as per wish, of course, if you want uh, very thin frames, you're going to pay more. Basically, you can make a setup from entry-level LCDs. And um, the hosting system, again, if you don't have a very high uh, frame per second rate, you can basically use a single GPU, which is, again, entry-level. So, this is what we have now. And this basically um, is our wall. It's, um, this is um, Xubuntu being virtualized in the virtual box. So this is a scenario where I have like 25 monitors virtualized and you see that basically uh, everything is scaling great. And um, what we wanted to see is if applications are actually capable of stretching over them and monitors because again, I mean that's a scenario that you don't have, get to test every day so we expected that there could be some issues but um, at least on Xubuntu, as far as we've tried all the um, desktop apps are working flawlessly. Uh, the issue with Xubuntu is, um, I mean, I have many friends who are uh, very fanatic about Linux, but this was one of the points that I was able to stack up their nose that the frame buffer refreshing is actually quite poor. I mean, the thing is that X11 doesn't keep a lot of back buffers, so uh, in, on, in case of a, uh, intensive drawing, you get a lot of flushes to the video memory, so it kind of um, creates a very high load on the actual on the GPU. I mean, Windows keeps uh, a number depending on the drivers, if it's VDDM or XPDM, but it keeps at least uh, one or two off-screen surfaces which are updated, and then the actual video RAM content is updated at the regular basis, so you don't get like a increasing decreasing load. Um, in terms of X11, and again, maybe I'm stupid and I don't know, but what we saw with vanilla Xubuntu is that we're getting uh, non-linear updates to this video memory and that kind of impacts the GPU because it has basically constant latency and if, if it gets the workload going up and down it, it starts to actually 
uh, slow down at certain points, and then again you, you get the mouse cursor flickering is all. But um, and uh, while we were writing one of our latest publications, we actually wanted to. I mean, because from what I've told so far, basically you could say that well, okay. It sounds cool, but yeah, if I have the money, I can basically put many cards and I, I have the thing and it rolls. Um, what we wanted to do is basically see that our attempt is better than other virtualization means. So what we looked at is um, the NVIDIA vGPU, uh, that is a thing which is present in the grid cards, that you have one physical card and actually it acts as multiple virtual cores, which can be either shared by many users or used by one. So and we tried to put up limitations uh, in, uh, in, uh, explicitly in the number of a homogeneous uh, surface. And as you can see, NVIDIA had um, four displays at near 4K rate. Remote Fix had 10 megapixels, but it had limitations on what host uh, and guest operating systems can be run. VMware is kind of lagging behind with their support. And for virtual blocks, we got the best numbers. Again, I mean, Linux is um, has the biggest total amount because it doesn't use any back buffering. Uh, Windows with XPN drivers, that the old legacy video driver uh, mode, which is used until Windows 8, uh, had 29 megapixels, and with Windows 8 and up, we can get 80 megapixels. And this is only because um, when virtual when virtual box creates a virtual GPU it has, for some reason, uh, a limit in the total video memory. I mean, simply, those numbers are basically how much frame buffers we can fit in the memory we have right now. But I've already talked to the virtual box, guy, box guys and they've said that if there's a really need, a really, real need, it's not that hard to increase uh, the amount of memory that uh, virtual box takes for the VRAM, and then we can go basically as high as we want. Um, so currently we're using um, a Tesla K40C and a GeForce GTX 750 Ti um, in our system to drive that wall. And we use it uh, two cards because Tesla is basically only a computing card. VirtualBox still needs uh, a card to provide 3D acceleration. Uh, it kind of forwards all the OpenGL and activity 3D calls from the guest system to the host system. And that's why it needs actually some underlying card which is able to uh, fulfill them. And I'm, I'm hoping to get uh, a quadro card, which could actually have both of them. So then I can return the cards, uh, three cards for you to play. And uh, yeah, as I said, we have 25, 22 inch displays, which uh, at their resolutions make up a total of 52 megapixels. And currently we've been able to polish the system to a state where we actually simulate one display. I mean, this is a screenshot you won't usually see on, on your desktops. So Windows is actually able to recognize this adapter and actually perceive its resolution. And I mean, uh, I'm sorry that I didn't have the time to take a better screenshot of the whole wall, but basically it really feels like you're in a single monitor. You have the task bar split all over the five monitors at the top, at the, at the bottom. And um, I mean, I don't, I don't know if you're aware, but I've seen a lot of applications, especially in uh, CCTV, where apps have issues with rendering video across many monitors. I mean, if you have like a switch player over two screens and depending on the render, it's at some times it's not able to update everything. And with this concept, we basically virtualize away the monitor count. And this point is actually something that is totally innovative in this approach because while we were using splitting mode, as I said, it's basically only in terms of money. If you have the money, you buy the cards and just don't use all the system. But this creates uh, removes a, word, a need to be aware of the monitors and um, just gives you one huge surface with one resolution and then you just do what you want. And another cool thing is, I don't, think, I don't know if you find this impressive, but with the virtualization we can actually uh, scale text mode OS. I mean, the thing I talked about with drivers is that, okay, you, you, you've got that thing, but you're only able to run it under Windows and when you load it. With the virtual box, Everything happens from the point we start the machine. So, I mean, you can take any text-based OS and using our system, we scale it to the uh, our huge wall, and it will just work. And the actual system that's running it doesn't need to be aware of anything. I mean, you, you can do this with any amount of GPUs.
Um, and since this is CUDA, I'm, I made some progress and finally got them to make um, a fully working CUDA pipeline. I actually didn't want to go into much programming details because I mean, I don't think anybody actually cares. But so, what is great about CUDA in our case? Um, the classical issue uh, for video encoding is that it accepts some weird color formats. Usually it's in UAQV color space. And there's a usual, uh, classical challenge of performing the conversion. If you're just converting and transcoding a single video, I mean, it's fine to do that in an i7 CPU. In our case, where we have like 25 parallel streams, uh, we would actually take up the processor totally if we would run 25 full HD streams uh, doing the color, color conversion on uh, i7. So what we're doing is, whenever the virtual box has done a video update, we perform memory transfer to the Tesla card and then using CUDA do the image uh, transformation. And basically this has turned out really good because we're able to do the memory transfer and color conversion for a full HD frame in under 5 milliseconds. Which is, it's comparable to what Intel has, but uh, the great thing is that we don't need to push the memory back because NV Ink for our lock is designed so that we can take the CUDA device pointers and then code from them. So basically, our <coughs> RAM load is reduced, um, our CPU load is reduced thanks to CUDA, and from the point when we push the raw RGB data to the device, CPU and RAM have like no more obligation to do anything with that. So that's great, and um, I need to do more experiments with different cards to see how well it scales, but um, I mean, since as already Benson told, told us uh, the last time, which uh, actually was very important, that yeah, I also saw that memory transfer is actually the hardest thing. I mean, CUDA runs really fast, but when you start pushing lots of amounts of memory forward and backwards, it actually slows down greatly. And um, now we're doing everything on one Tesla card, but um, I hope to get my hands on, let's say, two or three quarter, quarter cards and see how the performance improves if uh, we actually split the jobs on many cards. So, yeah, that's already what I said. That the frame rate conversion is really great. We have no CPU load then. We have really <coughs> reduced the RAM consumption. And uh, what is bad about this that um, I don't know why, and I hope that me and Richards in San Jose will be able to grab a hold of someone and understand it, but uh, all GeForce and low-end quadro cards are actually limited to having only two simultaneous encoding sessions. Maybe it's a market trick, I don't know why, because if you compare the CUDA core count, it doesn't differ that much, and at least as far as they've said, that NVENC is running a dedicated chip, chip on the card, so it actually shouldn't matter. But um, it could again be that they're <coughs> they have prohibited this so that somebody just doesn't uh, create a server who just does some HDTV transcoding consisting of cheap cards. Because I mean, I've seen a lot of people make like uh, <coughs> transcoding systems from Raspberry Pis and other um, embedded devices which are able to handle full HD streams quite fast and very energy efficient. And then if you need like to rip TV or do something, this back is kind of very good, uh, <clears throat> because at this point when looking at this, I mean, it kind of still doesn't hit the total price sweet spot, because currently the cheapest CUDA uh, Quattro card, which doesn't have limitation, is around 800 euros. Of course, if you can, if you can drive the whole wall, it's great, but um, at least from the numbers I've seen, I don't think that it will be able to provide 25 pesos on each monitor. So again, if we look at the GeForce Maxwell cards, which are entry level are around like 150 euros, then putting four of those, even if they don't have limitations, I think you should be able to drive the ball. But yeah, that's something I need to find out. And what's again more interesting that um, currently, uh, since the Maxwell second generation has also been released, there are no cards without this limitation, and which would have the Maxwell second version architecture. I, I don't know why. Because the new Maxwell cards are only G-forces and one Quadro, which is considered low-end and which has this limitation. And another issue with NVIDIA 
uh, that's more like compared to Intel who I've seen, but uh, it tends to produce low, uh, very low quality at low bit rates. But that's actually not an issue with us. I've, I've seen people complain this when they're using NMEN for game streaming, but since I mean our wall runs a dedicated qubit Ethernet, so uh, if, in case of 25 monitors, we have a lot of space for each channel, so we can actually allow a lot of network bandwidth. But uh, yeah, I mean that's that's one of the issues with NMEN. Ah, yeah, that's all. Any questions? If, if, if this could be uh, commercialized somehow, how do you imagine how it works? Will it be uh, some kind of dedicated software or hardware or solution? Well, I, I think that um, the best would be to sell it as a hardware solution because <clears throat> if, uh, if you would sell it only as a software, I mean, let's take the, the stack, yeah. our software that interacts with we, uh, virtual box back together with the virtual box, then you have lots of deployment issues like you need to make the user manually install the embedded systems, like make firmware upgrades if, if I change something. But if it, and uh, again, as for all the issues with frame segment uh, thickness, it actually would be better if the system would come in some kind of uh, <coughs> custom built frame where you, because what we see in the university is that our wall was made very fast and basically it's just a thick wooden board that also is on one side and piece on the other. And we're after now, after one year, we have started experiencing actually wires breaking down because everything is. And uh, I think that uh, for this to work, uh, there should be like a, I don't know, some kind of custom made best amount with holes for the Raspberry, uh, some kind of smart power because now we have power socket for each of the Raspberries. It could be some PoE mechanism. Because since we have the Ethernet, we could actually feed the raspberries from that. Um, so if it would uh, come as a whole hardware solution, all these issues could be could be addressed. If you just sell the software, then everybody's going to compl complain. Oh, I made a custom wall and everything's falling apart. Um, and at least as far as I've talked with the CCTV people, I mean they don't see any issue. I mean they basically need to put a big wall where they see their cameras in the wall in, a, in some kind of room. And I mean, they don't care if we buy, if, if they buy the whole package or they buy some software, and then they go to need to sell, uh, go to some installers and get the hardware from them. And, and I mean, again, as you will know, <clears throat> the margin profit of the hardware is also very good because I mean, you can always crunch some some additional figure on top of what you get from the actual manufacturer. You just put some kind of your own branding on top and that's it. So yeah, I'm looking uh, towards it more of a, like a whole system. Any more questions for us? Um, have you considered integrated graphics chips? Uh, uh, it, at which point? At the end of decoding or? Um, so... Because yeah. I mean, no, you could use several of them rather than these external GPUs. I think that will... Uh, the issue with this is that, I mean, we're kind of bound to those GPUs which are able to do the H.264 encoding. The issue with that is, as I told you uh, last time, uh, yeah, Intel HD cards have that. But the problem is they're basically not stackable. I mean, since they're on chip, if the card itself is too slow for what you... I mean, if you need like three tiles, three times three tiles, no, actually it could work perfectly, but if you go higher and if the system on chip is not able to drive your wall, then basically you're kind of uh, out of options. Uh, in case of using uh, the NVIDIA cards, you can basically stack up as, much, as many as you need. I mean, does it, or is there a parallelism that you can have like one chip per wall, or a proportion of the wall? Yeah, I mean, that's basically what we're doing now is that uh, I'm assigning each uh, physical monitor on the wall to a card because, I mean, you can't subdivide that. You need, uh, like, uh, um, an edge to 264 video stream. It's not breakable because it needs to be encoded by one encoder. Okay. But, but what we do, yeah, is that either if we're using one big screen on the virtual side or many small screens, then either each screen or a portion is assigned to a dedicated card, and that card takes. What I did before, when I basically my, my first start, start was a small 
it was basically a media box with, what, as I said, yeah, an integrated Intel uh, system on chip. And then I just basically pushed all the tiles to, to one. And then you kind of start having issues with uh, chip scheduling and everything. Uh, now, when I'm running uh, like two sessions on one GeForce and all the other sessions on Tesla card, I see that the memory bandwidth is better because, I mean, the memory doesn't go like one through uh, one single bottleneck. It, it, it's uh, distributed more efficiently. So that's why I see that having multiple weak cards would actually be better for both from t in terms of uh, performance and in terms of cost. Okay. What is network speed or network bandwidth necessary for such kind of system? Uh, well, again, I mean, it depends on the content. If the content is static and uh, there's not a lot of changes, the encode to video stream is actually very small. I mean, I haven't checked what, what is the, uh, <coughs> the maximum rate for, like, total noise, but, I mean, I, I think that for a full HD video, it's something around, I mean, for a movie, it's something around uh, 30 megabits. So I, I think in, in the gigabit Ethernet, for that kind of amount of markers, we're kind of safe. So you have a LAN, a gigabit LAN on the site, you know, for testing, but what about to, to put markers on well, uh, the different side of the internet and then try to like, connect there? <laughs> no, of course, no, that, that's, that's uh, a valid scenario because uh, apart from the targets I mentioned, I, I think that this could actually be very useful in public places like train stations and air, uh, airports where, I mean, they already have all these big timetables uh, <clears throat> and everything, but using the virtualization, they can actually like fire up a virtual machine per each and uh, have a centralized control point where each of the tables are actually, I mean, doesn't affect all the others because it, it, it's self-contained. Um, again, it hardly depends on the type of content. I mean, it will be, it, it can be big for a movie and it will be very small for like showing some static data like a table. So it's, without an actual use case, it's hard to give some actual numbers. Okay, any more questions for us? Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you. So, Benson, now it's your time to show what box you did in Tartu. And uh, show up what you bring the, bring us here today. So, how will you switch? You need the... Uh, I just need the... Okay, so you switch your computer here. Just <laughs> 
Windows ist ein Schau. Wie hat es so bei Ebra? Ich habe das nicht bei Ebra. Ich habe das nicht bei Ebra. Nein, ich habe das nicht bei Ebra. Nu, full HD movie, jo musí jen šudy vím, kde nepatří, když jsem FPS, jsem kde to rád, na celý stream, je to jen když jsem měl motor, je to úplně bajíš. To přijde, že to je tak jela. So your setup ready to go? Or 
they can split up the tasks. One chops lettuce, one chops tomatoes, beetroots, and carrots, and then they mix them up. And depending on how fast they do these things, one of them might get you the salads four times faster than one person doing it, or even 10 times faster than the slowest person doing it. Um, so that's parallel computing in a nutshell. Um, most computers today are parallel. This is parallel, so of course. Um, so you have to learn how to do this, and the sooner you learn, um, the longer your code will live. Um, that being said, uh, if you can kind of match your code to the hardware, you can bring the cost down quite a bit. Um, so the top end supercomputers are very expensive, but much easier to program. Uh, so in the 1990s, people had this idea as well, and they worked quite a bit on it. Um, and so there's a lot of literature left over from that era. It kind of died, but now it's appearing again um, as interconnect. Um, so uh, routers and switches, uh, which are affordable, um, increasing for increasing performance recently. So a typical thing to make, a PC node. So motherboard, CPU, RAM, Ethernet port. Um, so this is kind of what you'd have. So you can buy this. Um, this happens to be Intel. Um, this is kind of what's sitting in your desktop. Um, and this would be typically 70 to 100 euro uh, for one of these. Um, the one we're using SSDs, uh, just because those have much greater speed. So for data processing applications, that's quite useful. Um, you can also use hobby computers, so Raspberry Pi. Um, Banana Pro in parallel are also quite nice because those have um, integrated GPUs. So on the same board, you have like an accelerator card and or, uh, on type processor. Um, those are about three to fifty dollars each for the Raspberry Pi and Banana Pro. Parallel is a bit more expensive. And then the switch or router, and you're lucky here in Latvia, you have your own company that does this. Um, so for oh, hundred euro, how did they choose micro thick uh, stuff? Why didn't they take some some routers, some some usual gigabit switch, for example? So part of it is also that, um, to get the best performance, you actually do need to know or try and work as well as you can get information as much as possible from the manufacturer. So if you just want to connect things up together, you can go with whatever you have. Um, if you actually are very interested in pushing the limits on the hardware, usually it helps to know who designed the hardware and what they're running and how to tweak it. Um, and so if there's local support available, it's nice. Um, I'm not saying that's the only thing you can use. Um, Cisco is quite interested in this area as well. Um, most of the top end supercomputers use something proprietary, so they actually build and design the interconnect themselves. Uh, that's actually quite expensive to do. Um, and if you don't have a lot of time or expertise, and uh, maybe don't want to acquire it because it would uh, take away from your core activities, then um, find out who can help you. Um, um, so that works, um, uh, but it does take time to optimize these things. Mm -hmm. um, so, and this seems nice. It's close by. You can find out, um, and there are several related research areas at the university. Um, so certainly you can uh, do research with people who are far away. Um, but if it's a day, I mean, you can go somewhere a day, interact, and go back. That's also very useful. Um, much of, I mean, same reason Silicon Valley is so successful today. You have Stanford, Berkeley, UC Davis. Um, then you also have Intel, uh, Cisco. All of these companies have at least a lab there, um, if not a big office. Um, so you need an ecosystem. It's not. can't just do it on the whole on your own. Okay. So basic assembly, you put together a node, um, much as you would for a PC. Um, if you were going to do this for a high-end uh, system, uh, you usually just get high-grade components. Um, and a lot of the high-end 
systems will typically not use uh, PWD Ethernet, they will use something faster and more expensive. But if, all your, if your application is kind of massively parallel, then this is overkill. It's throwing money away. Um, you can use uh, off the shelf hardware. And then you install compilers. Uh, so typically, GNU compilers are the most common. Um, people are switching to LLVM for some cases, especially when you have just C code. You connect up the nodes using a switch, and install SSH server and clients, configure the network, and then typically use message passing interface, and that's kind of the default at the moment. Um, but there are other communication libraries out there, and people are developing some. Um, so the problem with this message passing interface is it can be hard to use if you're coming from a shared programming model. Um, you kind of have to think about collecting memory yourself and managing data movement. There are libraries that allow you not to do that. Um, the performance can usually not quite as good, um, but in some applications, this is very helpful. Um, so if you take something like MapReduce, this is a Java framework. If you're coming from working with Java and you can kind of use this to write your programs, it saves you a lot of time. And then you'd run a simple program. Um, you can optimize this whole process, so there are things that you can download and it'll set up a cluster for you. When you have clusters of 10,000 nodes or 100,000 nodes, you don't want to set up each node individually. Um, but if it's a small cluster, it can actually be or helpful as an educational exercise um, for groups to set up each node and then you'll connect them together. Um, alternatively, if you have 20 people and each file has a high guard, um, that's cost effective and you can build a supercomputer um, in a few hours. So, this is kind of first version we've done. Seitsu uh, Pasuke, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, uh, means chimney swallow in Estonia. And column two hat means 3000. And so, the next version will be nearly two hat, 4000. Um, but it's fairly simple. Uh, so, we've got some pine wood here, which is fairly common, I think, in Estonia, Latvia. Um, so this you can go and buy the hardware store, um, put together yourself. And then several shelves, each with regular motherboards, and then the middle shelf has a switch um, that they're all connected to. So this one has eight nodes, um, and we're experimenting with this and trying to get things to run. Um, but as you can see, it's not that big. Um, that's my foot in the corner here, uh, just there. So that gives you some idea when it comes up to the side. Right, so this can sit in your office. Um, if you're doing something like rendering, um, so suppose you want to make an animation, uh, this will work quite well. Um, the one that has AMD uh, APUs, so integrated graphics. Um, and each of them gives you, if I recall correctly, around 300 gigaflops for a single computer. Um, so, in terms of uh, cost to flop ratio, this is quite good if you're doing single position. Um, and that's the back, so you have all the power there, um, and then that's the side. So, uh, to summarize, you can actually solve some problems faster, and you can do this in a fairly cost effective manner. So, total cost of that is about, uh, I think, 2,000, 2,500 euro. That's less than the price of one fire for GPU. Um, so, uh, so there's a couple of references. Um, those kind of have all the information you can find on how to build a cluster um, and what to download. And just thank the people. So Albert was a student at the University of Michigan, pointed out these cluster competitions to me. Done some work on building clusters before in Saudi Arabia and funding sponsors. So thanks. And if there's interest, you can try and build one. Uh, well, build this one cluster now. But I can also discuss how to do this later. So and what would you would you show up today? For this color, is, is there some kind of working uh, working stuff? So um, there seemed to be a problem in moving the stuff here. Uh, 
So what we would need to do is kind of go through the process of getting it running. Um, so the, there's two PCs there which should be working. Um, so just be install Linux on them and connect them out together. Okay, so they're not blocks probably. <laughs> okay, if that, yeah, but well, we can discuss how to do this. Um, um, So not every application will map well to a yeah. GPU. Yeah. Um, if you're doing uh, essentially lots of rendering, then having lots of GPUs on one motherboard can be quite helpful because uh, you can have a high-end CPU, have lots of RAM, and just do shared memory programming and have a very powerful single node. Um, but usually the high-end chips uh, typically also consume a lot of power and uh, the way you want to, I mean, so the, the reason GPUs are very power efficient is you have lots of low, very lots of, lots of low power cores. Um, if you're aiming to build a fairly large or have a fairly high processing um, cluster, uh, you kind of want to mix between moderate power cores which can think and do speculative execution which GPUs are really bad at doing. Um, and you try, want to try and match those with uh, simple uh, parallel, um, uh, I guess, functions. Um, and you need to figure out how much your algorithm needs to use all the speculation versus how much is, uh, or can be mapped to something that's lots of cores and uh, parallels. Uh, so it, it depends on the application. Sure. Sure. I wanted to ask, I mean, you mentioned the banana uh, pie. Yeah. Uh, does any of your students have any experience with that? Uh, so we just ordered some. Because uh, the thing is, I was looking also at it because basically, I mean, it's, as you said, it's in the same price category as Raspberry, yeah. but basically it had a bit better CPU. Yeah. But when you mentioned GPU, I mean, uh, at least as far as I've seen, the interface to the GPU of that one is kind of closed or have, have, have you got like more experience with this? I haven't used it. The documentation says it uses a ARM GPU. Yeah. Uh, I think at the moment they only support OpenGL. Yeah, I mean that's, the, well, uh, okay, I mean in your case if, if OpenGL is not then yes because at least from what I've se seen then um, like in comparison to Raspberry, where the, actually the video core chip is totally open and open, and I mean it supports, I would say, any known programming interface. Man, uh, the setter or whatever it's called in the banana, it's basically yeah, it has OpenGL, and then they have some binary tools. I mean that's again from my short, uh, narrow scope of video encoding decoding, but they basically give you like binary files which you can feed files with stream, but if you want to like manually control something, then it's just a no-go. And I've seen there are people trying to reverse engineer it, and they actually had some luck. But uh, I was actually kind of amazed that although all Windows chips have become very popular, but they're still so closed. And I don't see the reason why, if they did this from scratch, why didn't they choose actually to implement open interfaces and uh, Actually, then they would uh, achieve a lot of uh, a, a bigger audience. But I mean, yeah, if if if, if anyone at your side is actually capable of um, having any other ways to interact with the GPU and OpenGL, it actually could be very interesting. So there is a team in this competition from Barcelona that is working with um, I think both supercomputer company, mm -hmm. and they're using ARM. Uh, CPUs and GPUs, uh, but they're using slightly higher spec GPUs which support OpenCL. Um, so that may allow a little mm -hmm. bit more programming. Yeah, that could be better. Um, so at the moment, I don't think uh, uh, the Macker is, um, is, is releasing these higher end GPUs on their cards. Um, the parallel one also is quite nice. 
and then there's a similar punch company that uses um, a, not a GPU but a kind of different accelerator architecture. Mm -hmm. um, most of these are closed. Of course, so they, they, they give you interfaces, but yeah. this is a cutting edge, and they're still competing and trying to survive. And that's kind of um, that's the one advantage they have over other things. So they're not quite ready to uh, fully release it. The development costs are also quite high. So once again, what was the what was the target for this competition, or judging criteria? Uh... So they get um, several applications which they have to port to the cluster, uh, usually scientific, and then they have to run them and try and get as high performance as possible, and they're judged on the performance. And how's the performance is measured? Uh, so it depends on the application. So the time of execution, some operation. First thing they will have to run is Linpack. So they have to solve the system of linear equations as fast as possible, and they count flops basically. So floating point operations per second. Then it means that the, the team who has a larger amount of money they can pay more, more hardware stuff and build larger, therefore machines are winning competition. Not always. Um, so there's a power limit, which is three kilowatts. Three kilowatt per everything. Yes. Okay. Which is about your vacuum cleaner. Um, so you can buy systems like that for only sixty, seventy thousand, or hundred thousand euro. Which is one approach to take. Um, so. If you're working with a company like Cray, you figure out what they're going to release just in time for the competition. You work on it beforehand and you show up and you want to show that it's a good machine. If you're going to build something yourself, which is doable, you want to go there and show that you can build something for maybe 20k that will beat the 100k thing on those particular applications. Remember, the big companies have to build one or two that will satisfy a very broad range of applications. In this case, there's usually space where you can uh, try and optimize for the few applications that you have. Okay, and uh, so I'm, I'm just thinking about uh, making some kind of not a competition but workshop for building clusters with the same same idea that you have uh, uh, in this project. So to replicate here, and uh, I'm just thinking about the practical practical some kind of uh, tasks for this cluster to, to be solved because scientific is probably not very interesting for students and, and at least for those who are practical are they not scientific oriented so and do you have in mind some kind of uh, real life examples what we could do with this cluster and we build it <laughs> just so render some some video I don't know I have some some so yeah. viable thing <laughs> No, I mean, rendering is actually quite uh, an interesting thing because uh, there's an open source platform called Blender. And this can take advantage of multiple GPUs or multiple APUs. And it's a simple test. You take something. Um, so that, that, that's not a very high communication intensive process. Um, you generate a scene, and typically what you want to do is render a movie. So maybe you render 10 scenes at once. You farm off one scene to each CPU, they, they, they do the rendering locally, and then they send back the images. Um, so if you have you know, 10 nodes, you speed up it's a factor of 10. Uh, so if, uh, for a lot of things, that's quite useful. Um, something that would take you, you know, two weeks gets done in a day. Um, another thing people do is architectural design, so CAD. Uh, people want to create models, you, know, you want to go and buy a house, you go to the architect, and you want to be able to kind of virtually walk inside your house. Um, and you want to do this in a nice looking house, right? You want, you want to see the books and high resolution and so on. So this is another application. Is this CAD application drawn on the one of the nodes or on how, how physically I could, Because I understood that when you have some 100 system with a lot of GPUs inside, so it's one operating system, so you have your CAD programs and it's rendering distributed through the different GPUs, let's say, and CPU. What's going on in cluster? How you run this CAD program? How? So again, the, the rendering is kind of farmed out. Um, rendering, you can do either frames, right? So you send a 